So let's start with 2008. And I come arri- arrive here on a very rainy day. Ah, yes, that's Seattle. And um, it was a daunting time, and we wanted to put together a long-term plan. So I learned a lot about political expediency. I learned a lot about short-term thinking. I learned how the pressures of the day drive out the strategic and the long-term. We did get some things done. I served six years in that job. 30 entrepreneurs and residents at UW and Wazoo, uh, 15 innovation partnership zones. We recruited world-class research teams in biofuels, smart grid, optical uh, computing. We were able to put together a plan that would integrate a variety of cabinet agencies uh, that would, would integrate a, essentially a comprehensive approach to our economy. So here we are today. And where are we? Well, we're back. All the jobs that we lost during the Great Recession are here. The cranes are popping up all over Seattle. Millennials are complaining that they can't find affordable housing. This morning, Bloomberg says that we're the uh, fourth richest metropolitan area in the United States. We have the fast gro- fastest growing city um, in the United States when it comes to metropolitan areas. So it's time to take stock, to take a look at our strengths, our weaknesses, our threats, and opportunities, and take a look over the horizon and see what the blue ocean opportunities are like and understand the strategic choices that we have uh, as a state. So let's get started. Hello? (laughs) There we go. So here's a part of the future I don't like to think about. Some of you (laughs) may have read the New Yorker article about the Cascadia subduction zone that we're just a few miles off of our coast. And this article talked about the rising probability of a 9.3 magnitude earthquake. That's 2,000 times more powerful than the 2001 Nisqually earthquake. And it would be an earthquake that lasts a long time, four or five minutes. It would launch a huge tsunami, 700 miles, all the way down to Northern California. It would inundate everything from the coast to I-5, and it would cause, obviously, billions of dollars of damage, loss of life, lots of injuries, and everything else. Are we ready? Are you ready for this event? So that's all I want to say about this particular future. (laughs) Let's move on to things we have a little more control over. Some of you are old enough to remember Clint Eastwood starring in a movie called The Good, Bad, and Ugly. So I'm going to use that as a metaphor. I'm going to talk about the good, our incredible innovation economy and our intellectual assets. I'm going to talk about the bad, about the disappearing middle class and rising income inequality. And I'm going to talk about the ugly, which is our failing infrastructure. These are three big complex problems. These are so-called wicked problems, but we have to address them. So let's start with the good. This is an amazing place. Not only is the natural environment beautiful and wonderful, which we all enjoy, but we are also an incredible habitat and environment for growing globally successful companies. I mean, where else in the world can you buy local when it comes to an airplane? (laughs) Or, you know, coffee, or fashion, or wine, or the Seahawks, uh, Super Bowl champs, we hope, Uh, or apples or whatever it might be. We serve probably a billion customers a day, one way or another, who get the value out of the products that we produce. And the credit goes to our entrepreneurs. They've done an incredible job. Entrepreneurs who had a great idea, but more importantly, they had the capability to build a business model that could scale on a global basis. This is another perspective of what's been going on here. This particular visualization, which is hard, it's kind of an eye chart, but what it does is represent six organizations in our state that have created 711 new companies and other organizations. So the yellow dot in the middle there represents Microsoft, founded in 1975, and orbiting around it are the spin-out companies, if you will, the children and the grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren of Microsoft. So going around on the clockwise, the kind of a pinkish type is Amazon, and then we move up to the University of Washington, and then next one up is Aldis, which is now Adobe, 
And we move next uh, over to Macaw Communication, which is now ATT Digital, and then finally to Boeing. <clears throat> this is an amazing uh, technology universe that we've created. So it's no surprise that as a state, when compared against all the other states in the US, we rank very high when it comes to innovation performance. Now there's a lot of controversy about how to measure innovation performance and capability and everything else, but the fact of the matter is we're right up there. We're right up there behind Massachusetts, Delaware, California. Now that looks good, but keep in mind that my friend Rob Atkinson, who does this every two years, this index, that uh, in 2012, we were second, and now we're fourth. So people are nipping at our heels, and others are advancing very rapidly. We are in an innovation race. So the first solution for this big problem, in my view, is we have to change our model of innovation. The way we usually think about innovation is that it's some guy in a garage or a research laboratory someplace that comes up with a great idea and does research, and then it moves through a process, a linear process, that we develop an application, we develop a prototype, we do some engineering, we test it, then if that works, we test it in the market, then we create manufacturing, then we distribute and we market. It is a long and painful and risk-ridden process. That's not going to be good enough anymore. We need to find a faster, more agile uh, way of innovating. And in my opinion, what we need to do is to find a way to innovate in a larger matrix of resources. And innovation, good innovation, is not going to be bolted to a single individual or a single geography. It's going to be about how we integrate resources from all over the world in order to solve big problems, be they water problems, or be health problems, or housing problems, food problems, etc. So we need to develop an innovation ecosystem in which there's trust between the different institutions. So our R&D institutions like UW, billion and a half dollars, R&D, Pacific Northwest Laboratory, billion dollars. <clears throat> How we connect that to our entrepreneurs? How do we connect the entrepreneurs to the funders that we have, our angel networks, etc., and the VCs? and how we develop human capital in order to support the growth of our innovation economy and education workforce development system, how we work with government. This is the new challenge of innovation. So innovation is not necessarily about the product, but rather about the process and how we move forward. Now, we have an experiment underway in Washington State that actually demonstrates how this might work. You can't innovate top-down. We did a very interesting thing at the commission. We worked on putting an RFP out, asking communities to put together a plan for building their innovation ecosystem or a partnership, innovation partnership. There was no money behind this program. Communities had to compete essentially for a designation. Today, we have 14 IPZs across our state, each of which is focused on a different technical area, a cutting edge technical area. So here in Snohomish, there's an aerospace IPZ. Out in Walla Walla, there's a wine IPZ. In Tri-Cities, there's a smart grid IPZ. In Bothell, there's a medical device IPZ. And uh, in um, Redmond, there is a uh, digital media and gaming IPZ. And uh, out in Grays Harbor, sustainable manufacturing IPZ. In Auburn, a sustainable industrial development IPZ. In Spokane, a healthcare IPZ. Pretty amazing stuff. Innovation does not happen top down. It happens organically bottom up. These folks were not chasing a grant or money. They were chasing a vision for their community of where their economy was going to go. I've had a lot of experience with federal grant type programs and a lot of times these collaborations are formed to get the money. When the money runs out, the collaboration falls apart. Hopefully the jury's out that these things will work. We're proud of the fact that the Council of State Governments made it number one award winner for an innovative public policy initiative. National Governors Association identified it as a leading edge best practice. Walla Walla, one of the IPCs out there, uh, gave the number one, the Aspen Institute, uh, the, the best community college in the country, Walla Walla Community College, which actually was the leader in putting the IPZ together. So very exciting stuff, a new model for innovation. It's about creating a habitat for innovation it isn't about venture capital availability, it's all about relationship capital and how we build the relationships among these different players and stakeholders. 
So let's talk about something that's bad, our changing workforce. I think we know middle class jobs are disappearing. There's a rising income inequality. You know, the number of people who have jobs over 125,000 a year is booming. Number of jobs being created at the low, low, low income, low skill level uh, are also booming below $35,000 a year. Not surprised that a $15 minimum wage campaign is underway all across the country right now because of this problem. It's happening for a number of reasons. Technological displacement, outsourcing, the fact that some people don't have the skills to get the higher paying jobs. But it raises some tough questions. Is the model of education, work, retirement obsolete? Is the way of learning in a classroom, is that an obsolete way And as we move forward? How do we train people for jobs that we don't really know what kind of jobs are going to exist and the kind of skills that they have? Very, very important kinds of questions. Our education pipeline is very badly prepared for the future. Of 100 students that enter ninth grade, only 36% go directly on to college. And when we compare ourselves across all the states, we rank right there at the bottom. 46th in college continuation rate, 47th in bachelor's degree production on a per capita basis. Very bad implications. We will, industry will have continued skills gaps and there'll be lost productivity. We'll have to continue importing our talent from outside the state. And uh, we'll have more poverty, more income inequality, and high social overhead to take care of that. So, another point, very quickly. Oxford has done a study of 750 occupations in the United States, and it says over the next 10 to 20 years, 47% of those jobs will be taken over by automation uh, uh, or computerization. Now think about that, that's a pretty, pretty stunning statistic. Not about ro robots, it's about cognitive algorithms, you know, where high level intellectual kinds of tasks are now going to become automated. I won't go through the whole list on this, it's a very interesting study worthwhile taking a look at. So we have to change our learning system, we have to revolutionize how we learn. First of all, we have to talk about a K99 system. It's about lifelong learning. <laughs> we can't front load all the learning up front, then expect to live off of that, if you will, intellectual capital, knowledge capital, the rest of our life. We need to have an education system that's relevant to the economy of the future, which means it needs to be more predictive. We need to get an idea of what is going on out there, the kinds of technologies, the kinds of jobs, the kinds of industry structure and business structure we have in the future. So we need to build that forward thinking uh, forward feedback, if you will, uh, back into our education system. More and more education is going to be self-directed. Students are going to take control over content and pedagogy and what they want to learn and timing of that, the flexibility of that. It's going to be location independent with mobile phones and tablets and cloud, uh, on demand, anytime, any place. And more and more learning is going to be peer-to-peer. -peer. We all know that's the best kind of learning. And with the explosion of social media, we have opportunities to learn in very powerful new ways, not just geographically, but you know, uh, all over the world. Gamification and fun. Clearly, our gaming industry, which we're leading in, Call of Duty ought to be a call to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as this industry begins to turn to learning opportunities, it's going to be learning being a lot of fun. The physical and the virtual world will blur. And a lot of micro-credentialing. We don't need necessarily four-year degrees, two-year degrees. You know, you go to Code Fellows, that's, um, gosh, you know, 10,000 bucks, 10 weeks, and you've got an $80,000 job. Uh, and so these little pop-up universities are coming up that are providing these micro-credentials. And industry is going to be a lot more involved, driving, if you will, industry skill standards. So my prediction, the wearable university. So be your tablet or your watch or whatever it might be, uh, this will be your personal learning assistant. Okay. Finally, the ugly. <laughs> Have you noticed it's hard to get around Seattle? <laughs> my, my. Just the other day, what, two, three hour delay because of those expansion joints, you know, that are going on. We need to think of a new way of solving this problem. This problem is more than just congestion and putting more lanes of highway in and more HOV lanes and more tolling. This is a fundamental paradigm shift that's going to have to take place. It's got to do with kind of thinking about the automobile and what it's done. 
Think about this. It's providing, uh, it's given us congestion, but more importantly, it's also having a huge carbon impact. 45% of our carbon impact comes out of the transport sector. And that's, of course, driven by oil and some small degree natural gas. Stimulus. Safety, think about this one. 19,000 deaths in automobiles between January and June of this year. That's up 14% from last year, same time period. And we're on our way to having the most, um, the highest uh, death rate from automobiles we've ever had. So here are three big problems. Congestion, a carbon impact, safety. Three big ones. Well, let's put together three ideas. The idea of our cars moving to be more electric and electrifying, if you will, the tra personal transport system. Let's start thinking about the shared economy in which we no longer have car ownership. Now, I'm a baby boomer. I love the idea of having a car when I was younger, right? My daughter, a millennial, she couldn't care less about automobile owner ownership. In New York, would you pay $400 a month for parking in the place of living? $400 a month where you work? and then pay for a car that's spending 95% of its time just sitting idle and not doing anything. And autonomous vehicle technology, which is now a hmm, million miles of safe driving, everything else, the ability for a vehicle to move around, navigate urban, and for that matter, highways autonomously without a driver in control. Result, if we put those three big ideas together and not think about solutions for the automobile, but a mobility solution, we can achieve within the next 10 to 15 years, in my opinion, zero congestion, zero emissions, and zero deaths. As autonomous vehicles learn how to collaborate with each other, we will triple the capacity of I-5, the main congested road of Seattle. <clears throat> so driverless cars are a lot closer than we think. Uh, the image on the left shows the GM Futurama exhibit. The next one is my electric car, 1976, which I think is when, before Elon Musk was born. This is what I commuted in, in Palo Alto. The next image along the top there is the DARPA Autonomous Vehicle Challenge in 2004 and five, which launched the whole idea of autonomous vehicles. And now we have today's Uber, driverless taxi. You order up on your phone, picks you up, takes you someplace else. We don't need to worry about the fact that if you're drunk or high on pot, or um, tired, or you want to text, this is not going to be a safety problem anymore. <laughs> so let me conclude with this incredible story. How many of you read Boys with a Boat? Wow, okay, some of you have. It reads like a novel. This is the story of nine guys from the wrong side of the tracks coming to UW and putting together a fabulous rowing team that went to the national championships in Poughkeepsie, beat those Ivy League guys from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and then went on to the Berlin Olympics in 1936 and took the gold medal. Fabulous story of teamwork, fabulous story of leadership, fabulous story of new rowing technology, commitment, will, etc. My dad had a phrase, not original with him, he said, if you want to travel fast, travel alone, but if you want to travel far, travel together. This is the story of how to do that. So we all have a responsibility. Well, no, there we go. <laughs> Hello? So what do we do? Any, every one of us, whatever our profession, whatever our role is in Washington State, we can do something and come up with an experiment. And we need to build an experimental Washington state. It's not about just doing better, it's about being different. And every one of us can make that contribution. So my call to action is to think big, start small, act now. Thank you.